Well, good morning. I want you to imagine for a moment, we're kind of getting into baseball season, so I want you to think about having a little boy that wants to learn how to play baseball. He's never played baseball, doesn't even know what a mitt looks like, doesn't know how to swing a bat. But he's all excited about it. He's thinking about, man, I'm going to go out there. The parent, if you're the parent of a little boy like this, you can see reality coming at him like a freight train. It's like, dude, it's going to be a lot harder than you think it is. And your biggest concern is that he's going to have a coach that will know that their little boy knows nothing about baseball. He's going to have to be taught from the ground up and shown, here's the things you need to work your way through. Uh, so that he doesn't end up uh, with crushing disappointment. He's going to survive. But as a parent, you kind of worry about stuff like that, right? Well, now, with that image in mind, I want you to think about God looking at us. And God looking at you in your Christian walk and your development. And maybe as a parent thinking, I want them to know kind of here's how it works. And here's how in each stage of your life it's going to look. And I know that you and I, when we get started in the Christian life, we expect everything's going to go smoothly. We think, oh, well, yeah, I'm just going to go from success to success, victory to victory. It often doesn't work out like that. And so sometimes we get lost. We don't even know where we are. So what did God do? To help us. Well, what he does is he sends us a coach. In fact, he sends us two coaches, which is really exciting. And we need one coach who will kind of tell us what to expect, work with our skills. And then we need another coach to kind of help us individually, like a personal trainer would, right? That's how we would learn baseball. Well, if you think about how God works with us, um, think about that first coach being the Apostle John and the writers of the New Testament. But for March, we're going to be looking at the book of 1 John, and we're going to get some great coaching from him. We're also going to get coaching from the Holy Spirit, who, like that personal trainer, is going to be able to say, here's how this applies to you in particular. And you're going to have everything you need to make it in the Christian life. Believe me. Now, I want to do a bit of a review. This is a second message on 1 John. And by way of review, the main question that this book answers, and it's in the New Testament, towards the end of the New Testament, and the main question that 1 John answers is, how do I know if I have a genuine relationship with God or whether I'm just deceiving myself? This is where John starts his coaching with us. Are you even in the ballpark? <laughs> do, you have, do you even have a mitt? Do you have a, are you able to suit up? This is, this is where he goes with us. Because we know from what Jesus said that some people will enter into eternity and face the God who made them. And they will think they have had a relationship with God, but they'll be surprised to realize that they were just kidding themselves. And Jesus will say those terrifying words, depart from me because I never knew you, right? And in the book of 1 John, this most loving of all apostles, John, they call him the apostle of love, surgically peels away all of that pseudo-Christianity with a series of if-then statements. As you go through the book, you're going to see over and over again, he says, if and then. If you say you know God, but you don't do what he says, you're a liar. Wow, pretty strong terms. <laughs> he says, if you say you love God, but you can't love the person right in front of you, you're kidding yourself. If you reject the truth about who God is in favor of your own opinions about him, then you're no friend of God. And we said the entire book of 1 John is about how to know if you're walking with God. And if you do, and if, if, if you have that certainty 
that that God is real with you, there's three indicators that can lead you to saying, I know God for sure, and that is that you accept the truth about him, you obey his commands, and you love others. Those are the three indicators, and this is what John has been saying all throughout the book, and he keeps circling back over and over again. Now, as you read through uh, John, I hope that this month, as we concentrate on just learning this little book, that you'll read through it over and over again. Please, soak in First John, will you? Uh, and let his truths just deeply come into your life. They'll, they'll both be life transforming. Now, <clears throat> you might rightly say, but what about somebody who's a new believer? You, you certainly couldn't put them on the same level and judge them with the same standard as you would somebody who's been walking with Christ for 50 years. Yeah, it's truth, obedience, and love, but truth, obedience, and love for somebody who just come to know Christ is a lot different than truth, obedience, and love for a believer who's been around for a long time, right? And so what John does in an amazing way is he takes these characteristics, truth, obedience, and love, and he shows us through this unusual passage of Scripture we're going to look at today, that those three things develop in certain phases. And he's going to relate it to age. And he's going to say there's sort of a childhood phase of the Christian life. And here's the truth, and here's the obedience, here's the love that needs to develop in that phase. Here's the young adult phase, and then here's the spiritually mature parent phase. And so... So this is going to help us. And again, these, these are general stages. They overlap, but he's gave, going to give us benchmarks in each one of these areas. Here's the benchmark of being a child. Here's the benchmark of being a young adult and a benchmark of being a spiritual parent. Okay, so let's look at those verses again because it's worthy of taking a second look at them. I am writing to you, again, this is 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 12. I'm writing you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you're strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So three different age groups, not listed in chronological order, but each having specific commands for each stage of life. A friend of mine named uh, Dr. Don Willett has put together uh, a helpful book called Stages of Faith, Eight Milestones That Mark Your Journey. And Don has really spent almost all of his ministry years studying this one passage and helping work people through it. And uh, I'm going to be borrowing heavily from the concepts that are in that book. And, And it's a great book. I recommend it. It's a great discipleship tool. And his premise is that each one of us, this is you and I, everyone sitting here, is meant to go through all three of those phases. Each one of us. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to overlay what Don says about the childhood phase, young adult, and parent phase. I'd like to overlay truth, obedience, and love and say, how does truth, obedience, and uh, love look in each one of those phases? Okay? And Don has a helpful graphic here. I think it might help us kind of see what, uh, what each one of these things. I'm going to pull out the verses related to each phase, and we're just going to go through it, starting with the childhood phase. Make sense? Let's look at the childhood phase. Well, here's what he says, John. Again, he says, I am writing you little children because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. And I'm writing you children because you know the Father. What are the two critical truths of this childhood phase? From looking at those verses, what would you say? This is where it all begins, right? There's something about the Son of God you need to know. What is that? 
that your sins have been forgiven. And there's something about the Father that you need to know. In fact, you need to get to know the Father. I want you to notice how John is opening our eyes to the Trinity. The Son has offered you forgiveness, and the Father is calling you into a knowing relationship. The Father is saying, come, get to know me. In one sense, you never stop being a child of God, and we're going to be in this phase for our whole life. And that's why I want to say there's a lot of overlap here in these phases. So they're just general characteristics. Don't get too legalistic about, you know, you go from here to here to here, because in some ways you're going back and forth in these, these phases. But the point that I think he's making is that there is a childhood phase from which you are meant to grow out of. In baseball terms, you start out as a little kid, they give you a bat, they take you up to the plate, and they have a little tee there that they put the baseball in, and you learn how to swing the bat and hit it off the tee. It's called tee ball. <laughs> That's where you start. And the kids are all, it's pretty hysterical because, you know, the kids don't even know, they're running to the wrong base, they <laughs> go in the, the different order, and so they're, they're basically just learning the essentials here. And that's cute, but if you have a son and for three years he's been in t-ball, you'd say, son, maybe this isn't your thing here. (laughs) You know, let's try soccer or let's try something else because he's stuck in that one phase. Do you know that a lot of Christians get stuck in the childhood phase? They can't get beyond these basic truths. For example, we talked about the fact that one of the basic essentials of this childhood phase is you got to know the truth about the forgiveness that you have through Jesus Christ. That's one of the things you need to learn, right? That's how you enter into the childhood phase. If you don't accept Christ as your Savior, you're not even in the ballpark. But I have found that some people get stuck here on just this phase because, for example, some people have very little capacity for self-examination. So maybe what they do is that they, they go forward at an evangelistic campaign or they accept Christ at a camp, but then they think, well, I'm beyond that, and they stop seeing themselves as a sinner in need of God's grace, and they, they begin to develop kind of a self-righteousness. And they're not coming before God and saying, Lord, every day I need your grace. What they're doing is they don't look at themselves, they start looking at other people. They become very judgmental. And what they do is they project their own sins onto other people. They self-justify, but then they're very quick to judge others. So they really are not accepting this truth about God's grace, right? Right? Because they they don't fundamentally understand that we're all on the same level. Nobody's above anybody else. We are all sinners in need of God's grace. And so then they don't obey God by repenting, and they have a difficult time loving other people. And so they get stuck in the childhood phase. The opposite of that is that people who endlessly come up with reasons why Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was not enough for them. And I hear this all the time from people who you believe should know better. And they say, well, I know Jesus died for my sins, but I, I still don't think that I'm going to make it to heaven. I'm like, what, what part of the cross don't you understand And if what Jesus did for you was not enough, then how could you possibly add to his work and get to heaven? That's not the way it works, you see. But friends, if we can't embrace the forgiveness Jesus offers, we're never going to progress in our walk with God. That's the first truth. The second truth in the childhood phase is you got to know God, God the Father, right? Just come to know him. I want you to think about a little girl who grows up in an abusive home. Her mother abandons her when she's young and her father is this raging alcoholic who is always talking her down and criticizing her. 
And all the men in her life just want to use her for immoral purposes. And so she grows up with a tremendous distrust and dislike of, of men in general. She gets bounced around after her father dies from foster home to foster home. And, but finally she gets adopted into a home with a loving mother and father. And, and, they're, and they're just like, man, we're going to love on this girl. What's going to happen? Some of you who've been involved with people from abusive backgrounds, you know what happens. She cannot accept that love. She can't trust because in her mind, she has been conditioned to believe that a father is someone you cannot trust, that men in general are people that you cannot trust. So she has trust issues, major trust issues. I've talked with women who are in this situation, and, and your heart breaks when you hear their story because you can understand why they would feel the way they do. They feel, oh, I just can't trust men. And I have heard this one woman who said, because of my background, I cannot see God as my father. Just doesn't work for me. Jesus, okay, he's kind of my brother and you know, taking care of, died on the cross, but I don't, I, and so what what she chose to do, instead of getting to know the father like you're supposed to be doing in the childhood phase, she just said, I'm not even going to think about him. And so she's molded her Christian walk around her wounds. And, and she's trying to move forward, but she really can't. And she's distorted the image of God. And she'll never get to really know God for who he really is. Now, in some way, we're all like that, right? All of us come from imperfect homes. I mean, if you had a father who you thought you could never please, you live your whole life trying to, in a sense, please the ghost of your father, and you tend to project that onto God the Father, right? And so God becomes this God that I can never please. Or maybe you have a passive father who let you just do whatever you want. And so you project that same view onto God. And he, God is this jolly old man that lets you do as you please. And he'll bring you health and wealth. Or if you have an absent father who was never there for you, he had no time for you, you're going to see God as this person, this being who's off on the other end of the universe and he doesn't have time for me. You see how we do this? We bring our wounds into our spiritual relationship, and we define God that way. The childhood phase is all about getting over that wound and allowing the truth of God to set you free. This is where we begin. As a child of God, getting to know your Father and getting to know Jesus Christ who gave his life for you. The writer of the book of Hebrews addresses a whole group of people who never got outside of the childhood phase. They spent their whole life as spiritual children. They stopped growing. And he says this in chapter 5, verse 12. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. You guys should be teaching other people about God, but you're still going to church and saying, feed me, feed me, because, because God has given you a Bible, you can feed yourself, but you don't want to do that. You just say, just feed me, and then you sip a little bit of milk in church on Sunday, and then you expect to go all week long on that little sip of milk. It doesn't work. He also says, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 6 Verse 1, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity. Hey, it's great that you know that Jesus Christ saved you. But you know, there's just a whole lot of people who that's, that's where their relationship with God ends. Hey, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. And then they go on about their business as if nothing happened. Many years ago, I had a neighbor who had a son the same time we had our son, Hayden. 
And at first, they appeared like two normal boys. But as they grew, it became painfully, very painfully obvious that this boy, this other, our neighbor's boy, had a disease that didn't allow him to grow muscles. And so even though he was growing bigger, he still looked like a baby. And he made it to five years old before he passed away. But that image of that five-year-old who still looked like a baby, that emblazoned itself on my mind. I think about how heartbreaking that was for the parents to see their little baby boy that should have been growing into a child and then a young man forever in the baby stage. How often does God look at us and say, there's so much more to the Christian walk, but you're still a little baby. Somebody sent me a text yesterday, very timely in fact, and it said, according to a recent Barna poll, this guy George Barna, he surveys the Christian world, only 4% of Christians have a biblical worldview. That means 90% of people who call themselves Christians don't know the basic doctrines of the Bible and they don't think according to the scripture. They just call themselves Christians. What would John say? John would say, either you're not in the ballpark at all and you don't know God, or you're stuck in the childhood phase. You say, what can I do? For some, especially coming from abusive background, there needs to be some counseling. With others, there needs to be intensive discipleship. And everybody should read a book by J.I. Packer called Knowing God. If you've never read that, this is like one of the key books, I think, that every believer should read at some point in their life. Because it basically introduces you to God characteristic by characteristic by characteristic. This is how you know God the Father. You want to know God the Father? Read this very simple book. It's a must read. Now as we look at the next two phases of spiritual growth, I want to reverse the order a little bit. We're going to look at young adult first and then fathers. Even though John talks about fathers first, he goes for the childhood, then to father. Why does he do that? Why did he confuse the order? Remember, remember, we're not talking to a Greek philosopher here. We're talking to an old man who comes from a Jewish background, and so you can just picture him saying something like this. Well, you start out as a child, and then you become a grown man, and oh, there's this teenage thing in between that happens. (laughs) Well, we're just going to reverse the order so we can kind of understand what he's saying here. Let's look at the young adult phase. What does it say there? He says, I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. There's three benchmarks here in this young adult phase of our life that we need to see. Number one, we need to overcome the evil one. We need to learn how to fight temptation that comes our way. We need to become strong. We need to get some spiritual muscle on us. And we need the word of God to abide in us. We need to know how to live out God's word. So it's interesting, John has more to say about this phase than the other two phases, probably because this is where you're going to spend most of your life. Hopefully, for most of us, the childhood phase of life doesn't last very long. I mean, in some ways, as you read through the book of 1 John, John calls us all little children. Okay, so we all get that. We're all going to stay in that. Uh, We're all going to be considered in some ways little children. But hopefully you don't stay in that phase. You progress to a young adult and then a parent. Okay, major battles and significant uh, accomplishments are made in this phase. But John has three primary tasks. He says, 
here, if you're in this phase, if you progress, here's what you need to focus on. One, you need to learn how to fight temptation, overcome the evil one. A big part of becoming a young adult, and this phase, by the way, is sort of like a crossroads. When you get into the young adult phase, this is where you have to choose, am I going to walk with God? Am I going to identify with God? Or am I going to identify with the world? Because when you enter the childhood phase and you make your commitment to Christ, you're going to really tick off the evil one. He's going to be so upset. And he's going to try to pull you back in to the old ways. He's going to have old friends come up to you and say, hey, come on back to the good old times, man. You, you're missing out on all the fun. And he's going to pull out all the stops and the world is going to press in on you very, very hard. And you're going to need to learn to say no. You're, you've left the domain of darkness and you're not going back. This is where, in this phase, you say no, not because your parents are watching you or not because the pastor might find out or because you go to a school that doesn't let you do this or whatever. This phase, every, all of this spiritual truth that's in God's word gets internalized and we say no to temptation because I believe it's wrong. There's right and wrong, there's truth and there's error, and there's things that God wants and things that he doesn't and not everything is okay. That's when you're starting to become a young adult. Secondly, you become strong. The Bible speaks about weak and strong Christians, especially like in Romans 14. What does it mean to be strong? What it means is that a weak Christian just simply does things because, hey, I heard a preacher say this on the radio, so I accept it. A strong Christian will hear something on the radio and say, let's see how that jives with Scripture. And they'll study it on their own. Believers, I hope that you don't just accept everything I say up here from the pulpit. I hope what you do is you hear what I say, and then you go home and you examine it and say, is what he said really true? Does it line up with Scripture? That's when you're becoming a young adult. If you're just accepting everything I say is the gospel truth, you're still probably in the childhood phase. The young adult phase is internalizing these truths. It's weighing it up, and it's saying, this is my truth. I believe this. This is, this is what God says is true and not true. You have a firsthand faith. And you know how to search God's words for answer. And then thirdly, you know how to live out God's word. It says the word of God abides in you. I love this quote that Don Willett has in his material. He's quoting somebody else, but he says... The Bible is not so much a book as it is a place where the soul has its rendezvous with God. Well, that's so true. This isn't just a book. It's where you meet with God. And the truths that are in this book will not only set you free from all of your wounds and all of the things that you've had to go through, but it will make you strong. You'll be able to stand up spiritually on your own two feet. And when persecution comes, and it will, my friend, we can see it on the horizon. It's here. But when it comes, you'll be able to stand because you know how to fight temptation and you're strong. And the word of God abides in you, lives in you. And in this phase, you go from, as a child, you, you, you're picking up little truths of the Bible. You, have, you memorize this verse and this verse and then this verse. As a young adult, you begin to string all of those truths together. And you see the balance of Scripture. You, you think theologically is what we would call it. But you're uh, globally, if you have another way to put it, but you're but you're seeing how the Bible all fits together as one message about how a fallen, broken world can come back into a relationship with God and you're able to put it all together. Finally, the last task. When we get mature, 
we come to what I think is, is the most fruitful and fun and enjoyable stages, and that is of parenthood. We don't have to settle when we think of becoming older in our faith or more mature. The vision that we have of what it's going to be like, you know, I've, I've, I've fought the battles of being a young man. For those of you who are, who are maybe older, now I, I, I need to say this, you could be in this parenthood phase in your 30s, okay? So it's not all just chronological. I don't mean to, to say that. In fact, if you are even in your 20s, you should start dipping your toes into the parenthood phase, right? But in this phase of your life, everything becomes about pouring your life into other people. And you begin to say, who can I disciple? Who can I encourage? Who can I hold up? And you're not going to end up on a golf course or playing tennis in a retirement center. That's not going to be your end. Your, the goal that you're looking at is fruitful ministry until the Lord takes you home. That's the vision here. Look at what it says. He says the same thing twice. It's interesting the way he says it. Look at it back to back. Verse 13, I am writing you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you fathers because you know him who's been from the beginning. I think you get the message here is that there is longevity here. You've known God from the beginning of your life, but you know the God who's been there from the very beginning. And it's interesting, John, when he is writing this, he's probably like 90 years old. All the truth we're going to be getting in March is from a guy probably around 90 years old. This is an old dude that we're learning from. But he's got battle scars. He's seen Christians come and go. He's seen people with a lot of promise flame out and deny the faith. And then he's seen other Christians who he probably wouldn't have bet on put five cents on them, and they turned out to be incredibly productive. John Mark is an example of a guy like that. And so he has something to say. And by the time he writes this, John is the last living writer of the New Testament. Paul is gone. Peter is gone. He's outlived him by 20 or 30 years. And now he's looking at everybody, to John now, is a little child. And so that's why he says all throughout the book of 1 John, little children, little children. And you just hear this imploring in his voice. You know, by the time you get to this phase in your life, here's the characteristic you need to think about. In the childhood phase, you're getting healed, right? And then, well, you're, you're hurt, but you're getting healed. I, maybe, maybe the best way to put it is, is in the childhood phase, you're hurt. You're still hurting. You're still wounded. You're still being motivated and driven by your wounds. By the time you get into the young adult, you're getting healed. Now, here in the parenting phase, you're ready to help. You go from hurt to healed to help. And as you're facing the uncharted waters of a body that's falling apart on you... <laughs> You're still encouraged because you have this sense of urgency to pass the torch on. And so your eyes are always searching. Who can I lift up? Who can I encourage? And I know that as, a, as an older person, sometimes you get the message that people don't want you around. Like maybe you've tried to reach out to young people before, you've tried to mentor them, you've tried to be interested, and you got the impression that they were too busy for you. You know, I, I get that. I think about like when I was young, I, I, was in a, I grew up in a great church, and I had these older people who were kind of wanting to invest in me. They just wanted to be my friend. And, and at first I'm like, who is this old dude? Why, why, do they want, why would you possibly want to hang around with me? Go play with people your own age. I'm just a kid. I didn't get it. I didn't get what they were trying to do. I do now, and, and I did really appreciate what they were doing. I remember, I, I think I told you about Mrs. Murphy before. There was, a, there was an old lady named Miss Murphy, and she wrote me letters in college, 
and it was kind of embarrassing. You know, I get a letter. This is back when there was no text, there was no smartphone. Everything was, you know, you got a letter. And I get a letter. Hey, is that a letter from your girlfriend? No, it's Mrs. Murphy, you know. And she just called to just, or she just wrote me this letter. She wrote me Bible verses. She said encouraging words. I still remember Mrs. Murphy. You can be a Mrs. Murphy. When you get to this phase of life, you're just thinking, hey, who can I encourage? And if you're older here, I would just encourage you, hey, don't get your feeling hurt. Stay with it. But find younger people that you can empower and you can see the potential in them that they can't even see themselves. And you can help them cast the vision of what they can be. And you can help them find their way. That's awesome. You know, this phase, more than anything else, is the phase of love. If you really want to look at it in general terms, the childhood phase is accepting the basic truths of the Christian life. The young adult phase is learning how to obey. And the parenting phase is just pouring out your life. Do you remember what Paul said? My life is being poured out like a drink offering. And I like another word that Paul says here to the, first, to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8. Listen to what he says. Tell me if this is not a spiritual parent talking to his children. He says this, having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you have become very dear to us. I pray that our church will be filled with spiritual parents who have a fond affection for the younger people in our church who search them out and are willing to be thought of as weird or misunderstood and to work through that because you say, I just, I just want to pray for you. How can I pray for you? God's put you on my heart. And I've seen you in, ch in church. And I really like the way you've interacted with the other kids. And, and you've impressed me. And, I, and so I just want to encourage you. If you're mature in your faith, and this can be for those in the young adult phase, you need to start thinking about this, but especially if you're getting older, <laughs> like me, you, start to got, you have to be able to think about who am I pouring into? Who are the people that when I'm gone will know Jesus better, will be marked for the cause of Christ? Who are the people that will have stepped into the kingdom of God, out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God because I shared Jesus Christ with them or I discipled them? How much difference can a spiritual father or mother make? I want to read to you a story that Don Willett shares about Corey Ten Boom. How many of you remember Corey Ten Boom? Probably a lot of you older folks. She was a Dutch woman who was sent by the Nazis to a prison camp when she was, I think, in her 40s. She was the daughter of a watchmaker. And uh, she was found to be hiding Jews in her house. They had a false wall that they built there. It was fascinating the way, I think it's an incredible story. I mean, you, if you haven't read The Hiding Place, her story, a, a tremendous story. They had a false wall built it was only about two feet by, I think, eight to ten feet. And they'd have a whole bunch of people in there. And they would come out, and then when the Nazis would be going and inspecting homes, they would give a signal, and everybody would go in there. It worked for four years. They were able to hide people in that space. But she was eventually found out, and she was sent to Ravensbrook Prison with her sister, Betsy. And in her book, she writes this about her father, that I thought was incredibly touching. And she says this, my security was assured as a child. Every night I would go to the door of my room in my nighty and call out, Papa, I'm ready for bed. And he would come to my room and pray with me before I went to sleep. I can always remember that he took time with us 
and would tuck the blankets around my shoulders very carefully with his own characteristic precision. <laughs> then he would put his hand gently on my face and say, sleep well, Corey. I love you. And I would be very, very still because I thought if I moved, I might somehow lose the touch of his hand and I wanted to feel it until I went to sleep. Many years later in a concentration camp in Germany, I sometimes remembered the feeling of my father's hand on my face when I was lying beside Betsy on a wretched, dirty mattress in that dehumanizing prison. I would say, Lord, let me feel your hand upon me and may I creep under the shadow of your wings. That's the power of a spiritual parent. So, where are you in your walk with God? What phase are you in? It's time to talk to the coaches, right? Again, in baseball, you got to let the coach evaluate your skills and put you in the right league, put you in the right position, tell you these are the skills you need to work on. Let's let John do that, shall we? Let's let John through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's your personal trainer. The Holy Spirit in you will say, yeah, you know what John is saying here? That's you. That's you. <laughs> Let's let him do that. And let us all continue to grow. Let us not be just part of a small percent, four percent of Christians. Let's, let's make that percentage grow. Let's at least in our church Say it's not just 4%, it's that we got most of the people here are growing. If you're in the childhood phase, there's no shame in that. That's fine. If you just became a Christian, you're just figuring things out, don't worry about it. John has said, here's the things to focus on. And at the right time, the Holy Spirit will say to you, it's time now to start learning how to do some of these skills in the young adult phase. And when you're in the young adult phase, he's going to say, don't quit. Don't give up. I mean, it's good you're fighting against sin. It's good that you're strong. But now you need to start pouring your life into other people. And the Holy Spirit will take the word of God and apply it to your heart. And it'll help you know where to go. Let us pray that God's hand would settle gently on our faces. So that each one of us might be encouraged to continue to grow. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we have once again seen how beautiful your truth is. And we are convicted. Some of us realize that we're not even in the ballpark. And we need to come to you as our Lord and Savior. Or maybe we're stuck in the childhood phase with molding our life, our spiritual journey around our wounds, and we need, to, we need help, God. Help us to get help. And Lord, some of us are learning how to fight the battles of temptation and stay strong in our faith. God, help us to be strong. We don't want to be disqualified from your work or set aside because of something we've done. We want to live holy lives, good lives, upright lives, so that we can then be fruitful and see our life and your life really in us reproduced in many, many people. God, do your work in this church. Settle on us in a powerful way. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand and join us.